Hello everyone, thank you for checking out my YouTube channel today, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. I am your host, as always, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined by a very special guest for a series on race and ethnicity in the ancient world. Dr. Rebecca Futo Kennedy, thank you so much for coming on today. Happy to be here. Dr. Louise Hitchcock asked me to ask you if you would explain the Dorian invasion to not just me, but to my audience, such as, did it happen? And if not, why does it persist? Yeah, so um, this is a huge split, traditionally. Nowadays, pretty much nobody in the last, nobody over the last, I don't know, 200 years, really. Um, actually, I would give it, nobody in the, since the 1960s or 70s actually believes that this thing was ever real, uh, that it is in fact a fabrication made in starting in the 1830s from ancient sources that could or could not be interpreted that way and from the imposition of a theory of linguistic diffusion of the Indo-European uh, family of languages uh, onto a sort of militaristic invasion model. Um, so I'll start with what it is and then explain why I just referred to it that way and um, etc. But what it is, is this idea that Dorian Greeks are actually Northern Europeans who invaded down into the Greek peninsula, specifically into the Peloponnese, not to Attica, um, but into the Peloponnese, um, where the, what we call the Dorian dialect um, is the was the dominant form in antiquity uh, of, of Greek. And not the only one, but one of the dominant ones, right? There is a bunch of dialects in the Peloponnese. And that this has been tied traditionally to one, like I said, the idea of trying to figure out how languages dispersed over time. Uh, and so people who were tracking the language of Indo-Europe, what they call Indo-European families, uh, of which pretty much all of the Europe, modern European languages and lots of other languages are branches of. And attaching it to this myth that we find referenced one time in Herodotus of the Heraclids, the sons of Heracles, leading a group of people from north. What they really mean probably is like closer to Thrace, <laughs> or maybe Achaea, um, which is sort of northern Greece, down into the peninsula um, to take power. And a conflation of this idea of, of the return of the Heraclids or the, the coming of the Herac sons of Heracles with linguistic diffusion. And also a misunderstanding of how languages diffuse. So Chadwick in the 1970s is the guy who first said, we really need to go back and explore this idea of how language diffused. And then archeologists for 200 years have been saying, there is no material evidence of this thing that you're calling the Dorian invasion. So the linguistic language model was being preferred against the complete non-existence of archeological evidence, but it persisted uh, in part because one, there is a strong tendency in our sources starting in the 1830s, particularly in Germany, of thinking through nationalistic lenses, but also um, thinking through racial lenses, and specifically thinking through replacement, population replacement models of, popu of people movement, of immigration. Immigration, according to the, a lot of these models, can't function by simply people moving and integrating and assimilating, but they treat them as population replacements. And that just doesn't show up in the archaeological evidence anywhere. And it doesn't show up in genetic evidence either. There's been a lot of uh, attempts recently um, for in ADNA study studies to use, to re reify this idea of a Dorian invasion by saying, oh, look, we're doing DNA testing. And look, there's 14% of this genome that expresses as Northern European. And so there's evidence of the, of the Dorian invasion. Um, no, actually, like 7 to 14% of DNA suggests diffusion and assimilation modeling, <laughs> not invasion or replacement. Um, but so one of the reasons why this model perpetuates and continues to be popular is in fact because it is explicitly tied to race theories um, and explicitly tied to um, what became Nazi race theories but actually predates that by over 100 years. And it occurs, and I think one of the reasons why it's really perpetuated is because it occurs in Madison Grant's Passing of the Great Race. <laughs> and that is like one of the source texts for the Nazis, actually, for Hitler, that they used. Uh, he loved Madison Grant. Um, and it's actually one of the most diff diver uh, sort of diversely referred to texts on the internet by people who reference this model. So I'm going to show you a map of what this looks like in a German textbook from before, so from the uh, 1939 German textbook. So this is from a German 
textbook from 1939. Um, if you look at a linguistic map, the place wherein the Dorians came from is at, like where the Indo-European language came from is like over here, <laughs> sort of in the, in the steppes near uh, Central Asia. Um, but by the time we get to, um, to the 1830s Dorian model, uh, and then we get to Madison Grant and others, that model has switched to here, <laughs> right? So this idea that you have these sort of central Germanic peoples, and uh, this is when we also sort of see this idea of a Nordic model uh, moving down into Greece. If you look at the dates also, it shows them moving to Italy, it shows them moving to North Africa, it shows them moving to Asia. And what this map actually uh, perpetuates, is, it shows is a theory that Madison Grant pr uh, promotes and that Hitler seems to have believed in that all great civilizations from antiquity, whether it was the Mesopotamian Valley civilizations, the Egyptians, the uh, Greeks, the Romans, uh, the Carthaginians, even the great uh, civilizations of the Indus Valley, these were all in fact Germanic Nordic invaders who invaded these territories, set up these advanced um, civilizations, and then because of climatic influence and race mixture, these civilizations disappeared. This is a great book. I just want to show you this book because I think um, people, if you want to know where these sort of, I, where these theories, I laid out the, this guy, Chapiteau, uh, Greeks, Romans, and Germans. And he actually pulls out all of the German textbooks and the German scholarship that builds these, these fantasy narratives uh, and shows you how they're they were constructed by the modern German state. And one of the theories that he pulls out is that they actually, so, so one of the most important theories from antiquity for race and ethnicity is actually environmental determinism theory. It continued to be a very important theory. It got revived, it was used all throughout the medieval period and became ingrained in the US in particular in, um, in uh, race, scientific racism uh, and at the Smithsonian Institute and sort of in anthropology. Um, but Hitler actually argued at one point or said at one point that the, the reason why the, the first German settling of ancient Greece didn't work is because the climate corrupted them, <laughs> right? That, that hot climate deteriorated the good Germanness <laughs> of them. And that, uh, that, that, that only changed after they, um, uh, later. And this is sort of, he's saying this before the World War II invasion of Greece, which treated the, the, the modern Greek population horrendously, right? I mean, they just indiscriminately murdered um, Greeks um, during the Second World War. And that was part of the rationalization is that the ancient culture belonged to Germans. It didn't belong to Greeks. Uh, so, and that's a longstanding theory that goes back to this Dorian model and promoted by German historians like Fallmeyer and others, and who actually argued too that the modern Greek population was Slavic, not Greek. So, so there you go. That's the Dorian invasion. Uh, and the reasons for this perpetuation is, is purely racism. <laughs> so if you, if you want to know.